Coming up on Extraordinary Faith, we'll take you to London's historic St. James Spanish Place, a center of traditional Catholic worship. We'll learn about London's thriving sacred music scene from St. James' young music director, and we'll listen in on its renowned professional choir. We'll talk with the chairman of the largest organization in the world dedicated to promoting the extraordinary form. We'll journey to St. George's Cathedral, where a girls' choir has embraced the classical Latin repertoire. And we'll meet the convert priest who heads the Anglican Ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham. Join us on our jolly old journey through traditional Catholic art, architecture, liturgy, and music on Extraordinary Faith. Hello, I'm Alex Began, and welcome to Extraordinary Faith, a program that travels far and wide to bring you the best in Catholic art, architecture, liturgy, and music. In this third episode coming to you from London, England, we're going to get some glimpses into some unusual initiatives to promote Catholic tradition. From accommodating Anglicans who wish to unite with Rome, to finding an entire organization complete with office staff that promotes the traditional Latin Mass, London covers all sorts of bases, and that includes our first stop, a cathedral that formed a girls' choir to sing the classic Catholic repertoire. You might be wondering where talented young lady singers practice their craft, considering that the Westminster Cathedral Choir consists of only boys. The answer is that they flock across the Thames River to St. George's, the other Catholic cathedral in London, the seat of the Archdiocese of Southwark. Norman Harper is music director at St. George's. Norman, how did the girls' choir come to be? Soon after Nick Gale became director of music in 2000, he decided that this was something that was missing from the musical tradition at St. George's. And so the organ scholar at that time started a girls' choir and then in 2006, he asked me to take it over as he was moving to another post. And I've developed it from there, but it seemed to me a very sensible thing to have done because you have a boys' choir and a girls' choir, each with a distinct function in the cathedral. Girls sing at 10 o'clock mass in the morning, boys sing with the men at 11.30 mass, and it works really well. Better? Yeah, okay. What ages of girls are eligible to participate? We audition them any age from nine upwards, and if they wish, they can remain in the choir until they leave home to go to college. So they, theoretically, nine to 18, but usually the girls will leave at some point before that when the exam pressure gets too much for them. Uh, but it is wonderful having voices that won't change in the way that a boy's voice will change, and so they can just keep going. We noted that your choir is unique among local choirs and that you actually allow one of your girls to direct the choir from time to time. Well, I, I need one of the girls to direct, in fact, because the way the Mass is run on a Sunday morning, they sing without a professional director, because when I've taken their rehearsal and got them settled in the stalls for the 10 o'clock Mass, my job is then to come back down to the song room here to rehearse the boys and the men. So the head chorister or the deputy head chorister will conduct the girls, especially in the motet, I mean, much of the service, they'll sing without a conductor. Uh, so with the assisted organist playing the organ and a girl standing out the front, they do really rather well. Thank you, Norman. Now let's listen in on the girls' choir rehearsing for a Sunday Mass.
With an office and staff in London's Covent Garden district, the Latin Mass Society of England and Wales is the world's largest organization promoting the extraordinary form. Oxford University fellow Dr. Joseph Shaw serves as its chairman. Joseph, how did a young man such as yourself become so passionately involved with the Latin Mass? Well, I simply started going to it. it about 12 years ago, I noticed that it was being advertised in Oxford for the first time. Uh, I, I didn't realize at the time that there was being said um, in a way that couldn't be advertised prior to that, but it was finally advertised. And I went along. The mass was being held in a community center in a, a box-like room. Um, it wasn't exactly the most uh, wonderful venue for it, unlike this church here. But it was being said with the full permission of the Archbishop of Birmingham, and I went along and I was hooked. And now you've become the chairman of the Latin Mass Society. Give us some examples of what the Latin Mass Society does. The Latin Mass Society's primary role is to organize devotional events. So we have a lot of uh, pilgrimages and uh, special events, uh, masses in special places, but also the local Reps, representatives of the society organ, help to sustain the regular masses which take place in their areas, Sunday masses, masses on Holy Days obligation and so on. The other things we do though is to represent the views of our members, those who are attached to the traditional mass, to the hierarchy uh, in England and to Rome if necessary. And to that end, we do a lot of research and uh, we engage in, in, in a certain amount of campaigning. So we've had things translated from Latin, historical documents which are important, I've done research in statistics of the state of the church in England since the 1960s um, and things like that. One of the more recent publications that I've heard about is a set of position papers. Could you explain those? Yes, I coordinated the publication of these uh, position papers for the International Federation Una Voce, of which I am now the treasurer. Uh, this is something which I've been doing now for uh, three years, and each one is on a particular aspect of the traditional liturgy, which is a, a controversial or raises questions or people that don't understand. So they are executive summaries, if you like, of the liturgical and theological debate surrounding uh, particular aspects of the Mass. Who were these meant for? The position papers were initiated in response to the debate going on about the future development of the 1962 Missal. So the Missal obviously is, is frozen in its development in, in 1962. It doesn't have any saints who were canonized since then. Um, and as well as them, there are inevitably proposals that we should make it more like the Novus Ordo in one respect or another. So the position papers take each little issue, each thing that might be changed or isn't understood or needs to be defended and explained, and gives it a a treatment in the form of a, a sort of executive summary of the theological arguments. I'm always impressed when I visit Catholic bookstores in England that I see a certain magazine show up in almost every bookstore there is, and you're behind it. What is that magazine? Our magazine, the Society's magazine, The Mass of Ages, is a quarterly magazine for members and supporters, and it's also sold. Um, and we're intending to um, make it free, in fact, at least for next year, which is our jubilee year. So uh, people, can, people can see it. It's a full color uh, magazine with uh, stories about the, the traditional mass, uh, theological reflections and news. You also have a website that's a encyclopedia of resources for the old right. Yes, um, www.lms.org.uk. It has a lot of material on it which, which can't be found anywhere else. I mean, notably, uh, a few documents which uh, is, have been retyped or even translated, uh, which, which aren't available on the internet. Recently, you published a guide to arranging a Tridentine funeral mass. Yes, it was something that we felt was very much needed, as our older members are, of course, going to their reward. And there are many people who aren't familiar with the Latin Mass Society, but do remember the traditional Mass and would like it at their funerals, um, who wouldn't have any idea about how to go about it. 
Looking back over the past several decades, what would you say is the LMS's most significant accomplishment? The priest training conferences, I would say, uh, which started just before the motu proprio uh, came out. Um, it was clear which way the wind was going. Um, the traditional mass was going to be made much more widely available. And we started a series of these conferences, and the first two were enormously successful. They were attended by enormous numbers of priests who'd been waiting for this signal of official approbation. They just wanted to know that right from the top, this really was a kosher thing to do for them to do, and they wouldn't get into trouble for doing it. So there was this big overhang of demand. Um, but even since then, we've carried on doing them once or even twice a year, and we've now trained more than 100 priests how to say the traditional mass. And they often come back to future conferences to learn, uh, for example, different roles in high mass um, and to brush up their skills. Now, looking down the road, looking forward, what do you think are the most significant challenges you're going to face? challenge of any small charity, of course, is, is simply to keep going, to find new people who, to whom you can pass on the torch. And we're very lucky in that respect. There are many young people involved in the traditional liturgy and um, involved in that in mass society. In relation to the development of the traditional mass in England and Wales, uh, we can see now that you know, we are here to stay. It's certainly not going to disappear. But it's still very limited. There's just one or two places um, in each diocese, or you know, perhaps five. Um, but that's still so small in terms of you know, numbers of parish churches that most Catholics will go through their lives without ever experiencing it. So we need to find a way of getting it through to um, the great majority of Catholics. I mean, some of them won't like it, but some of them will. And we know every time the traditional mass appears in a new parish, there are people who never thought about it before who become very attached to it and becomes important in their spiritual lives and, and, and really helps them in their, in their lives. So that's what we need to do to take it to the great mass of, of Catholics somehow. And it's, it's a difficult thing to do. You mentioned getting the next generation interested. How do you manage to keep up the level of enthusiasm in the LMS? Well, the short answer, of course, is the traditional literacy itself which inspires enthusiasm. It happened to me, it's happened to uh, people uh, in the past, and it, it's happening to people uh, each year. Um, you know, I meet young people, uh, people of all ages, in fact, who discover it for the first time, and they think, gosh, this is, this is so amazing, I, I, I really need to actually help with this, and not just you know, sit back and enjoy it. The Catholic Church has always extended her arms of welcome to those of other faith traditions who wish to unite with the Church of Rome. One of the most ambitious initiatives in recent decades has been the establishment of the Anglican Ordinariate. Monsignor Keith Newton is a convert and head of the Personal Ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham here in London. Monsignor Newton, First of all, what is an ordinariate in general, and what is the Anglican ordinariate in particular? Well, the ordinariate is a, a juridical structure of the Catholic Church. It was originally put forward for the, uh, the care of military chaplains. So it meant that it, it wasn't geographical, but it had an ordinary, the person who had jurisdiction, and would cover a, a particular area. This juridical structure was used in, in creating the ordinary it's for Anglicans who are entering the Catholic Church in a corporate way through the provisions of the Apostolic Constitution Anglican Orum Chaetibus. Um, it means that, that there are groups around a particular bishop's conference uh, area who are um, not necessarily geographically in, in a, any one particular area but spread over a larger area who are all uh, in communion with the, the See of Rome like any other Catholic but are under the jurisdiction of the ordinary of the, the ordinariate, which is me in the case of the ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham. What is meant by the Anglican patrimony that the ordinariate brings to the Catholic Church? Well, when the Apostolic Constitution was first published and the, the then Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, spoke about it, he spoke about us bringing with us some of our traditions and practices and ethos which are compatible with the Catholic faith. So there are a number of things. I mean, there is an aspect of liturgy. There's also um, 
hymnody, which is very important to Anglicans. I mean, often that has been um, perhaps um, ignored in some Catholic churches. There's probably a pastoral sense that we have, which is quite different from what happens in the average Catholic parish, mainly because, of course, congregations are much larger in the Catholic Church in England and Wales than they were in the Church of England. There is also the sense of mission to the whole community, which has been always important to uh, Anglicans. And often in, in the Catholic Church, you're, you're ministering to a gathered congregation because um, the Catholic Church was not established in the way that the Church of England is. There's always a sense of Anglicanism of actually being for the, everybody and so looking out in a wider mission field, if you like, rather than just lapsed Catholics. So that's very important. Um, there's also, I think, probably something about the way we preach may be a little bit different, much more biblically centred. Uh, all these things are, are part of what you might call the Anglican patrimony, which the Holy Father suggested we brought with us, providing they are compatible with the Catholic Church. But I would want to say th one thing that's very important is that when you bring gifts, it's not you to say what the gifts are really, it's for what, what people to say you've brought. That's what receptive ecumenism is about. You can see that you've brought these gifts and people will say to us, actually, what we can see is this. And that's much more important than us saying what we think the patrimony is. Could you describe the liturgy that you offer and where did it come from? Well, ordinary groups and ordinary priests can, of course, use uh, the, the, the Roman liturgy, either in the novice order or in the extraordinary form. That's perfectly acceptable and allowed. And some of our congregations do, in fact, worship using the novice order. But we have been provided with a particular liturgy and other liturgical books. Already we have an official book of occasional services, including marriage and funerals and reception into full communion and confirmation and baptism. We have a, a, a text for, for Mass uh, and we hope there will be a full missal produced at the beginning of next year. But we are, some of our congregations are using this text. And the, the text has come from an interdicasterial commission set up by the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, including liturgical scholars, some members of the ordinariate across the world, because there are two others, one in Australia and one in America. And they've met together over uh, the last two years in order to put together this mass rite. It includes passages and prayers from the Book of Common Prayer, which has been part of the English religious tradition for over 400 years. So for instance, the confession will, um, will com comes almost exclusively from the Book of Common Prayer. There's a prayer of thanksgiving at the end of Mass, which is in the Book of Common Prayer. There are other aspects as well, the, the, the very famous prayer, which is called the Prayer of Humble Access which is very beautiful, which is said just before communion. So they're part of bringing something from the Anglican tradition. In addition for, to that, there were many Anglo-Catholic, as they're called, uh, churches, which used an English translation of the Roman Rite and would use some of the things that are part of the extraordinary form, but in English. And they are allowed to be used within the ordinary liturgy, but in English. So there are prayers at the foot of the altar, the traditional offertory prayers in English, and also, if wanted, the last gospel at the end of Mass. And I felt that there was a call to that greater unity with the Catholic Church. Um, and when the Apostolic Constitution was uh, published, it seemed obvious, obvious to me that I should accept this incredibly generous gesture, which was a pastoral response to Anglicans who have been to the Vatican to say, can you help us in this difficult situation where the, the Anglican community is breaking apart, it cannot agree about doctrine or about morals. And uh, those of us who've entered the Catholic Church find an incredible joy of being in communion with each other. Um, there are obviously nuances between many Catholics about how they, they do things. Um, but, but everybody is in communion in the Catholic Church and we're clear about what the teaching is. It is, it is in the, the catechism of the Catholic Church. We know what the Church teaches. Most major cities are fortunate indeed if they have one or perhaps two professional level Catholic choirs. At last count, London has an incredible 13 such choirs. One of the most accomplished is the adult choir at St. James Church in Spanish Place in the Embassy District of London. Yeston Evans is the parish music director. Yeston, let's start off with your background. Where did you come from and how did you get here? I'm originally from, from West Wales, but um, after university I moved to London 
originally for a year to become organ scholar at Westminster Cathedral and, um, and I've never left. And um, so I'm still here in, in, in London making music in this wonderful city. What do you do the rest of the week? The rest of the week I teach two days a week in uh, a school called the Cardinal Vaughan School, which is a boys' Catholic school. And I also run the music in, in, a, in another church in the city and various other musical, musical events. Now tell us about the choir you have here. What services do they sing for? So the choir regularly sings for a 10.30 Mass every Sunday morning, uh, the Solemn Mass, and then on various feast days we'll do often an evening Mass and obviously Christmas and Easter and those, those sort of services. And weddings, funerals? And weddings and, and funerals as, as and when they come in, yes, that's right. Is your choir comprised of professional singers or amateurs? It is. It's a professional choir. It's a professional choir of 10 singers, three sopranos, two altos, two tenors and three basses. Yeston, as a regular visitor to your church, I've always been struck by the competence and power of your singers. How have you been able to round up such a talent base in a city with so many other good choirs? Well, thank you for your, for your kind words, but um, we're very lucky here in London. I think London is a, is a melting pot of, of talent. A lot of people come here, you know, obviously in all, all sorts of works, work, walks of life, but particularly as as musicians, a lot of people perhaps who've been through the Oxbridge system and um, people who've been to other good universities and, and they come here as students and, um, and they're looking for work and we're very lucky to be able to, to, to offer them that and we're very lucky. I've got a, a fabulous team to work with of very, very good singers. Why has the parish decided that it's important to fund a professional choir? We've been very lucky. We've had uh, a succession of very supportive parish priests. Priests who, I think, realize that this is a very beautiful church. And I think as, as, as human beings, but I think particularly as, um, um, as believers, we're looking for beauty. And here we have a beautiful building and um, very inspiring, dignified liturgy. And it seems that we should have good music to accompany that and, um, and to, to inspire the, the members of the congregation. Give us some idea of your choir's repertoire. We have a fairly wide diet, but a lot of what we do comes from the 16th century. And I think especially because of, of this church being St. James's Spanish place and what was the, the Spanish embassy, we do do quite a lot of music by Guerrero, Victoria, Morales, composers like that from, from, from Spain. And um, we tend to do, um, maybe once a month, we'll do a, a classical mass, in other words, something by Haydn or Mozart or something like that, to, um, um, to keep the punters happy as well. Not many choirs are able to master both Gregorian chant and polyphony, but your team seems to be able to do that. How have you been able to train them? I suppose actually I'm just very lucky here to have a group of very talented musicians who can turn their hands at all sorts of things. So maybe maybe yesterday some of them were, were singing an opera somewhere or doing a concert and this, this afternoon they might be off to sing Evensong and, um, or do a, a, a film score or something like that. So they are able to, to turn their hands at all sorts of um, different, different genres. But also I think especially with the chant, um, some of them have been choristers maybe themselves and therefore it's, it, it's in their blood I think. I notice you have an interesting approach to doing the credo here. You split your choir into two segments. That's right, that's right. We have um, two organs here, one on the, as it were, liturgical south side and the other at the, um, um, at the west end. And um, so we put half the choir with the smaller organ and then the other half with the larger organ and then the congregation will join in with those. So it alternates between, between the two. It just gives a little bit of, little bit of choreography during the services. <laughs> This church is also known for hosting occasional special events in the extraordinary form. Does your choir sing for those? Every, every now and again, yes. Occasionally there are um, a few extra services. Most of their services, um, they have a mass here every Sunday, but that, that, is, um, that is a said mass. But sometimes when we have confirmations and things in the old rite, then we'll, we'll do those. But the main function of our choir, I guess, is, is to sing at the, at the new rites Latin mass on Sunday mornings. Our film crew was fortunate enough to be able to record St. James's Choir singing at this morning's Sunday Ordinary Form Latin Mass. Let's listen in.
on our next episode, travel with us to the quaint town of Heth in rural Oxfordshire, England, where the traditional Latin Mass has found a home in the historic village church. We'll learn about the Association for Latin Liturgy, an organization which helps Catholics choose among the numerous Latin Masses in England by grading them in a directory. We'll visit the famed convent of the Tyburn Nuns, where the sisters will show us around their shrine to the English martyrs, and we'll tour London's St. Etheldreda Church, the oldest functioning Catholic church in England, dating back to the Middle Ages. If you'd like to learn more about the people and places we visit, take a look at the episodes pages of our website, extraordinaryfaith.tv. Please also like us on Facebook so you'll receive the latest information about our upcoming plans and broadcasts. Thanks for accompanying us on our voyage through Catholic England, and please join us next time as we continue to explore the beauties of Catholic tradition here on Extraordinary Faith.